Thanks for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, as peace talks over Ethiopia's war continue in South Africa, Amnesty International accuses all parties in the conflict of abuses and violations. Their calls for an investigation and warnings that the findings are key to a just and sustainable peace. Also, security is at the top of the agenda for Burkina Faso as its new government gets going. The plans to tackle the jihadist insurgency destabilizing the country on every front. And tis the season. Fans of Tunisia's blossoming wine industry call for the sector to be opened up to make it more competitive. But first, there are no clean hands amongst the combatants in Ethiopia's two-year civil conflict. Rights group Amnesty International has called for an international inquiry into abuses committed during the fighting between federal troops and their allies and forces of the northern Egyptian region of Tigray. Amnesty's investigators say that all parties have committed human rights violations. Delegations from the warring sides are currently in South Africa for delicate African Union-led peace talks, Laurent Berstecker talks us through. There is no innocent party in the Tigray conflict. That's how Amnesty International described the multiple human rights violations recorded in Ethiopia over the past two years. Violations which the NGO says could amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. The Ethiopian National Defense Force, the Eritrean uh, Defense Forces, the Tigrayan Forces, the Amhara Special Force, the Amhara Fano Militia, all of them, they have committed serious human rights violations, including rape and sexual violence. Amnesty warned the crimes were punishable under international law and called for a comprehensive investigation into the alleged violations. The call came as Ethiopian and Tigray leaders met in Pretoria for much anticipated peace talks, which kicked off Tuesday under the mediation of the African Union. The United Nations Office for Refugees, which had been ringing alarm bells over the humanitarian situation in Tigray for months, said it was closely following the talks and urged the warring sides to seize what could be a final opportunity for peace. That's the only way forward. If the parties do not really engage meaningfully in a solution, in a negotiated solution, we'll be in this situation forever. The talks come as the Ethiopian army recently registered a series of military successes in Tigray. But despite losing control over a string of towns, including the strategic city of Shire, TPLF leaders remained defiant and said Monday they still had the military capacity to defeat their enemies. Burkina Faso's new government has said that it is on a war footing and its top priority is security. The cabinet was unveiled this week after Captain Ibrahim Traore seized power earlier this month from ex-leader Lieutenant Colonel Paul-Henri Demiba, and he was then named president. Now, Demiba had himself also seized power back in January. Both coups were prompted by the country's struggles to contain a seven-year extremist insurgency that's cost thousands of lives. This week, authorities launched a drive to recruit 50,000 civil defence volunteers to help the army fight jihadists. Now, the extremists control about 40% of the country, and President Traore says that the country faces an unprecedented security and humanitarian crisis. On Monday, at least 10 soldiers were killed in an attack in the northern border town of Jibo. Since February, supply convoys passing through there have been consistently targeted by terrorist groups. On Wednesday, the UN's aid chief, back from a visit to Burkina Faso, urged for more relief to be given to communities in Jibo. Sophie Lamotte reports. Some of the latest reports from NGOs who have been working on the ground in Jibo show that accessing food, water and even medical services has become particularly difficult for the more than 350,000 people living in the city. They depend on the few escorted supply convoys to access food and other basic necessities, but these often fall under attack of armed groups. Many of them have to collect flowers and leaves to feed themselves and their children. 
We live in such difficult circumstances here. We have neither food nor drink. I cannot describe what life has become for us. Dying is better than what we are experiencing here. We have to buy leaves and 100 CFA francs to boil and to give our children. The main message from Martin Griffiths, the chief humanitarian coordinator at the UN, was very clear. The main priority for Jibo is to find a way to lift the blockade and open the roads around the city. He met with Ibrahim Traoré, the new leader, and expressed hope and confidence that he was the right man to bring positive change to Burkina Faso, given his military background and experience working on the ground in cities like Jibo and Kaya. So we talked about how to make these things work. And we agreed with him, uh, or rather he told us, that he will put into place the necessary um, arrangements within the Humanitarian Affairs Ministry to ensure that we are able to carry out uh, our obligations and responsibilities, but to do so in a way where there's clear, tra clear transparency with his people as well. Ibrahim Traoré himself took power, claiming that his predecessor failed to curb the terrorist expansion in the country, and it seems that he's tackling this issue head on. He recently launched a drive to recruit 50,000 new members into its military in a bid to address this worsening security situation and safeguard passage of humanitarian convoys in cities under siege. Well, a Nigerian federal court has instructed the government to pay 500 million naira or over 1.1 million euro in damages to a jailed separatist leader and order that he be returned to Kenya. Now, the judgment said that Namdi Kanu, the head of IPOB, or the indigenous people of Biafra, had been illegally renditioned back to Nigeria from Kenya last year. Samuel Okoya tells us more. The court's verdict is not just a legal victory for separatist leader Unam Dikanu. It is also an indictment of the Nigerian government. The court ruled that Kanu's extradition from Kenya, without recourse to the legal process, was a gross abuse of his fundamental human rights. Kanu's lawyers had told the court that he was illegally arrested, blindfolded, tortured, and chained to the ground for eight days in Kenya before his extradition to Nigeria. He has been facing trial for terrorism since his extradition to Nigeria in June last year. It is the second legal victory Kano has secured against the Nigerian government in two weeks. An appeal court in the capital, Abuja, had earlier asked the government to release him. The court said the government has lost the legal rights to try him because his extradition from Kenya was illegal. The government has failed to obey the first court order, citing national security. It is unclear if the government will obey the second one. Kanu is the leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, or IPOP, a group advocating for a separate state from Nigeria's southeast. The Nigerian government has banned IPOP, saying its activities threaten state security. Nigerian security agents have been accused of carrying out human rights abuses in their attempt to stop the agitation for a separate state of Biafra. Samuel Okoye there for us. Now, pharmaceutical giant Moderna is reportedly thrashing out a deal with the US government to develop several new vaccines, including one against Ebola. Both the more common Zaire strain and the separate strain behind the current outbreak in Uganda would potentially be targeted. Now, it's unlikely that the Moderna shots would be ready in time to be used in the current Ugandan outbreak. There, at least 30 people have died of Ebola since September 20th. There have been at least 109 infections and they may be escalating. On Wednesday, at least six children of the same family tested positive in Kampala, taking the number of cases in the capital to 15. And finally, Tunisia's wine industry is doing well, counting on the pallets of more than 2 million local consumers. Despite fears over the impact of climate change, this year's harvest promises to be a bumper one. Their calls for the sector to be opened up to increase competitiveness. Our correspondents report. In Grumbelia, the Nefer's vineyard, the harvest for the Carignan grape variety is almost finished and promises to be a good vintage. Excellent. It's excellent. We're at least at 12 degrees, 12 and a half. Mohammed bin Sheikh has been working on this 200 hectare vineyard for two decades. There is not a high quantity, but the quality is here. There was a fall in production because of heat waves and a lack of water. 
but also because grapevine imports were limited by a quota in place over fears about the bacteria Silella fastidiosa. The sector also lacks an organization to represent it, which affects quality. Only 30% of wines have origin certifications, like those of the Neferis vineyard. We need to adopt all that little by little. And you will see that the sector will improve by itself. And the wines in Tunisia will definitely improve. The Neferis estate is producing new wines and diversifying its products to include wines with a fruitier taste and attractive labeling for a growing clientele of women. There's been an increase in consumers with the opening of lounge restaurants where there are many women customers, so we have adapted our wines to this clientele. But because of religious conservatism, alcohol consumption is still taboo in the country. Authorities often neglect developing the sector despite its economic benefits. We have many state-owned vineyards that are partly, if not completely, abandoned. I think that's a shame to leave them and not use them. Professionals see an opportunity there for young people who are suffering from unemployment, as well as a chance to boost exports by increasing yields. Well, that's it for Eye on Africa for now. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care.